I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast Supplement. Well, Lee, this week, um, any lingering traces of unbiased judgment on our parts are going to go bye-bye, because uh, the book we're talking about this week is written by a professor that both and I, you and I, are working with currently now at the University of Oregon. He's on our committee, so even if we wanted to say bad things about him, we couldn't. He's my advisor. So. And he's, yeah, he's my kind of second-in-command. Right. We are talking about The Edge of Knowing. By Roy Bing Chan. Yeah. Uh, it's a pretty remarkable book. It's quite um, good. It's quite good. And, you know, you say that, we don't say that with a tone of surprise, um, but it's true that a lot of the, the, the books written by tenured professors for tenure, for their careers, tend to be very dense, yeah. hard to approach. This is not, this it's, is not Reader's Digest, no. but we're not talking about Jacques Derrida or something where you're going, yeah, this what is, is something, happening? So the thing that I like most about this book is that it's a great series of close readings yes. organized around the dream or dreams in 20th century Chinese literature. So, the, yeah, and the whole idea of the book uh, is, you know, there's this narrative of how China comes into the 20th century, how it sort of joins the quote-unquote modern world. And especially in literature, what that meant was having to come to grips with a very different way of writing literature, doing philosophy, doing science, kind of a different way of knowing anything, right? Or saying that you know things. To, to be technical there, a different kind of epistemology. Epistemology. I go. wasn't going to use it. Yeah, I wasn't going to use it. You were it. thinking it, though. I'm more of a, a person of the common man than you are, I suppose, but um, a proletariat, that's me. <laughs> um, but Roy's book goes... Yeah, but what do we do with dreams? Because there's a lot of dream stuff throughout Chinese literature in the 20th century, and it's never just like the Zhuang's a butterfly dream going, eh, I don't know, I don't really need to figure anything out. This is actually positioned in many texts as a way of knowing things, like an actual real way to know the it's world. A, it's a method to kind of achieve real knowledge through this alternative existence, form, yeah. of, form of experience or existence or something like that, right? It's, it's kind of like a sandbox for... In, in the sort of technology sense, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Where you test things out to see if they work before you actually go somewhere with them, right? So instead of writing a novel saying, hey, this is what we all need to be doing, you go, what if we made this a dream sequence and really threw a bunch of ideas in there? Because of course in the dream, anything can happen and does happen. And yet, because a lot of these early writers were, were influenced by Freud... It's not totally removed from reality. It's coming from somewhere real. So that makes the reader go, this is real and also not real. What's going on here? So it's a way of testing out to see what's going to happen before you put it out in the world. Um, the dream thing for me in uh, Roy's book, I, I, is it okay if we just call him Roy? Because that's how we know yeah, him. Yeah, we, we should call him Professor Chan, but everybody yes. here at the University of Oregon uses first name. So. Yeah, it's just that kind of... A university. So Roy, uh, I, I think the dream thing is interesting. The dream thing that Roy does is 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 quite fascinating. But I think the most interesting thing, and we shouldn't skate over this, mm -mm. is the fact that Roy has these uh, really good close readings yes. that he does of, let me see if I can remember correctly, the writers. It's Lu Xun and his- uh, uh, um, Wild Grass. Wild Grass, mm -hmm. which is a trippy dream sequence that we've talked about My before. pick- in a podcast years ago for my favorite work of Chinese literature. That's right. Ever. Um, then we have uh, Mount Dun, and then who else, Rob? There's there's uh, several um, early socialist Marxists. So, or, so this is the 1950s. We've got a, couple, a bunch of people from the Maoist era, and Maoist. particularly Jiang Qing, Mao's Jiang Qing, wife. Yeah. Um, so two things about that. One, uh, you wouldn't believe how short the list is of people who are both theoretically informed, very have read their everything from Marx to Derrida, but who also really know how to just read a text. In a way that's not, that is not that is still approachable. Yes. that You know, our seminars, Roy, frequently what he would do is give us about a 20 or 30 minute lecture on anything from Wittgenstein to narratology or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the second, sometimes hour and a bit of the course was just all of us in a circle reading here's the chapter we're talking about let's really break it down that's mm. old school literary analysis but typically in the academy you have to choose you're either going to be a theoretical person or a close reader and ne'er the twain shall meet and roy the thing is both. that roy does really well is that he yeah he does both of those 
quite well. I should also point out with this book that simply having quite a few socialist or leftist writers is unique. Uh, there are very, very few people taking seriously, for example, Jiang Qing. I honestly don't think I can think of another scholar who looks at Jiang Qing's work and, and really thinks about it. Usually it just gets lumped into the, wow, that was an interesting curio for the time. Yeah, and, and Roy does a really good job of going, wait a second, we need to take propaganda seriously. It doesn't have to be, we don't have to think that it's good, but at the very least we need to look seriously and systematically at what this was trying to do and not see the socialist period from 1949 to 1979 as just some sort of break where the rules of reality broke down and and things just went haywire. Let's actually take this period seriously and see how it's part of this longer arc in Chinese literature. And the dream is crucial to that because it's one of the things stitching together any text you care to find or any period, right? There's these huge breaks, right? You, if you study May 4th literature and that's what you love, there's no way you're going to take seriously a poem written in the Maoist era, right? Because held to just strict aesthetic standards, there's not really much in the Mao era to even think seriously about. But from the standpoint of a dream, they all have dreams. Dreams are going all through this this period. Yes, but and, and this is one of the really cool things that Roy brought my attention to, is that he talks about how during the Maoist era, especially during the, the sort of high Maoism of of the Cultural Revolution, you, you really don't have dreams because the way that authors during this period from the late 1960s on into to the, the early 1970s, the way they're conceptualizing the night is very different from how anybody ever previously thought of nighttime. Hmm. It's thought of this as this time not of a space of relaxation or for, for you to just hang out and drink beer and, you know, make love. He's, he's talking specifically about that. Um, it's also, a, you know, under high Maoism, it becomes this period where you're just supposed to be working. It's a yeah. time of production. And there's this really cool part where he talks about how bright this the nighttime is during a lot of these literary pieces. Hmm. And he, his, his thing is just that, you know, the period was so keyed in to increasing production that even in literature, you just have this kind of manic need to work even through the night. Even the dream is has to produce something, has exactly. to do something. If and you it, have dreams at all. Yeah. And there you know, I think it, one of his points, if I remember correctly, is there are there aren't that many dream sequences during yeah. this period. But which is interesting in and of itself. And that's a great point. I, again, it's something I kind of forgot. But that that's a great point that uh in this era, one of the things that it actually took a while to do is to come back to the idea of look, if socialism's gonna go somewhere there has to be an element of imagination and fantasy somewhere. Otherwise, I mean, the whole point of Marxism is there's there's a future, right? We're going to go somewhere. Mao's going to take us somewhere awesome. Where's that going to be? Well, if we're all going to go there together, we got to be thinking, what is that going to be? We have to think about it and, and imagine it. That comes up in, in spurts, uh, largely underground, but there is this weird tension between, well, we got to have some imagination and almost fantasy, but... That's not working. That's playing. So can't really do that. And that's the tension that I think Roy draws on is you're not supposed to dream, but if you don't dream, you can't really go anywhere, can you? And he makes this kind of uh, astute uh, point. Uh, Roy is a Marxist, and he makes this astute Marxian point that Maoism, you know, it grounds itself in Marxism. It claims this mantle of Marxism, but in eliminating nighttime, which is essentially what happens in this period of high Maoism, they get rid of nighttime in in terms of literary theory, um, and authors are not talking about nighttime. They're talking about just daytime part two and producing all, right. all this stuff. <laughs> daytime right. part two. Um, it, it's, uh, what happens is Maoists are forgetting the dialectic of Marx, and, mm. you know, every—, every in, 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 essentially a dialectic is just like everything has to have its equal and opposite reaction. Yeah. And, you know, that, that kind of tension between these two sides is what actually creates existence. So he argues that in, in eliminating night, they're forgetting that daytime needs night for it to be daytime. 
you have to have something that's not that thing. Um, and Thank ultimately, you know, it's funny because we're, we're doing this whole, uh, this is, this is going to come right smack in the middle of our, our discussion of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s in our 100 Years of Chinese Literature podcast. This is one of the things that makes the literature and art from the period so, frankly, awful, is that <laughs> it, it, well, it is. Broken um, record. It is, I know. But it's precisely this idea of there's not supposed to be anything but what we already have right here. This is it. Work with your comrades. That's all you need. You don't You don't need a rich internal life. You don't need dreams. You don't need fantasy. All you need is your comrades, your work, and the glorious socialist future. But when you're never allowed to step outside those lines, eventually one of the things that that breaks the system is there's just nothing outside the lines, so there's, n- there's no direction. There's nothing— to, to put it in another way, how do you have a plot with tension in it when there are no problems in your society, when, yeah. when your society is— uh, imagine to be perfect. You, you want to hear a great modern day version of that, Lee? Yes. The very first season of Star Trek The Next Generation was conceived by Gene Roddenberry to have characters with no flaws and there were never going to be battles or problems. It was going to be a perfect future. And Did the creators of the show were like, yeah, we can't actually make a show out of that. <laughs> so uh, people still attempt things like Maoist China, even in the West, which is crazy. But... Um, to, to go back to, to Roy's book, um, it's it's focus on dreams and it's taking seriously text from the Maoist era, which really I'm I'm not kidding, nobody takes seriously. And and we mentioned earlier Zhang Qing for the the listener who doesn't know who Zhang Qing is. Zhang Qing is Mao's fourth wife, um, and she is uh, partially responsible for for a lot of the horrible things that happened in the last 10 years of Mao's life, but she is definitely blamed for all of them. So you have this kind of tradition in Chinese history that... She's one of the gang of four. Yeah. Well, when... I mean, just to put it in historical terms, right? Like, when women take power, bad things happen in, in, in a kind of Chinese conceptualization i'm not making that argument i'm just saying that that is what happened that is how a lot of folks in chinese history understand things and so Zhang Qing taking power is viewed very negatively it's like oh now all right but we've seen the empresses so that. no one takes Zhang Qing seriously as this kind of literary critic they're all just kind of mar her tar her with this brush of like oh she's the the like person who called the cult caused the cultural revolution But Roy actually takes her seriously and kind of gets into these interesting literary debates that she had. Um, She actually was was kind of debating the red uh, dream of the red chamber, Hong Mm. Lamong, with with some literary folks. And you know, like I I don't think that much of Zhang Qing, but but it's fascinating that Roy is able to pull these interesting tidbits out. That's I think of the. the things that I really liked about this book, the yes. fact that he's taking socialism seriously, the fact or that he's taking propaganda seriously, the fact that he is uh, has these amazing close readings and the fact that he kind of has all of these really interesting tidbits that even as a scholar of Chinese literature who's taken lots of Roy's classes, I didn't I didn't know anything about them. Those are the three things that I think. And I feel those, those are mine, too. I will just say if you're if you're someone interested in this stuff, this is. Gosh, this is so worth a read. It's you. It's time well spent, uh, and and we would be saying that even if he did not have our fate in his exactly. Hands. <laughs> even if he if even if he wasn't the one that was going to pull the trigger on my thesis or not or dis you know PhD. But um, and I'll say as a closing thing here, uh, one of the things that I think prevents a more robust understanding of China today is an inability to take seriously propaganda and stuff from the Maoist era. There, there's just this hole in the middle of the 20th century, and then we just start over again, right? And the inability to see connections between that era and this one, I think, is is a problem, right? Uh, Roy's book's a good place to start because it does provide you a way of seeing where some of these ideas came from. You know, Xi Jinping didn't didn't spring fully formed from the head of the communist party. He, he came from this era and encountered a lot of this stuff. And this, it can be very important to read it. I think that's a great place to end it. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese literature podcast supplement.